Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start recording. My name is Kristen, and I am the Outreach Coordinator here at South Florida Wildlife Center. For those of you that aren't familiar with what we do here at South Florida Wildlife Center, we are a wildlife hospital that is located in Fort Lauderdale. And our mission is to rescue and rehabilitate sick and injured wildlife so we can rehabilitate them and get them back out into the wild, as well as educate the community about peaceful coexistence with our wild neighbors. So every month we do host our wild lecture series where we bring in different speakers to talk about different conservation and rehab related things that they have going on on where they are. So today we're really excited to have our very own medical director, Dr. Charlotte Penoyer, joining us today to talk a little bit about methods um, that we use to help reduce stress in our wildlife patients. So I'm going to go ahead and spotlight her video so she can do her introduction. Hold on one second. There we go. There she is. Um, you can go ahead and unmute yourself, Dr. C. Great. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, so today we're going to talk about reducing stress in our wildlife patients. So I'll go ahead and share that. Okay. Can you guys see the PowerPoint clearly? Yeah, everything looks good. Okay, cool. All right. So we're going to jump right in. So um, as we were saying, we rehabilitate native wildlife here. And um, reducing stress while they're in our care is one of our primary objectives and something we stay aware of at every aspect of their care throughout the entire rehab process. All right, so the basic principle is that all wildlife in a rehabilitative setting are under varying degrees of stress. So first of all, when they come in, they're coming to us because they have a problem. Uh, they might be sick or malnourished, injured, and that's the initial stress that these animals are feeling. Obviously, being injured is painful. That's a stressful experience. Then add on top of that, that uh, they are now in an unfamiliar setting, which is captivity. So these are wild animals. They're obviously terrified of people. We appear as predators to them. Um, so not only are they coming in with a basic baseline of stress, but now everything that we're doing to them is stressful to them. And so we make it one of our main goals to reduce stress during their care. That way we can facilitate faster healing, help avoid inadvertent injury during care, and therefore producing better patient outcomes. Um, what I mean by help avoid inadvertent injury is that if an animal is panicking, it's more likely to hurt itself as it tries to evade you because uh, it thinks you're going to eat it. So common reasons that animals come to our hospital. Um, there's certainly much more than this list, but I would say that these are some of the most common ones. So orphaned babies, um, either something natural happens to the mother or sometimes um, there might be something like tree trimming, they fall out of the nest, um, injury, we see a lot of animals get hit by car. Unfortunately, also gunshot, um, fishing hooks. Like I mentioned before, the babies might fall out of their nest and sustain some trauma if their nest was very high up in the tree. Um, aggression between animals, predation attempts. Uh, we also see animals due to illness from infection, and we do see a wide variety of viral, bacterial, and fungal causes for that. And then toxins are also very common. So there could be a natural toxin such as botulism, which occurs naturally in the environment. And then also things such as lead, if they swallow a fishing sinker, um, unfortunately, rodenticide. So these are just a few of the reasons why animals might come into our hospital. And all of these are clearly going to induce stress, both an emotional stress from fear of what's going on and also the stress of dealing with something that your body is trying to heal. To talk a little bit very quickly the physiology of stress and why this is so relevant to us not only are we worried about the stress of our patients from a welfare concern but it also directly affects their immune system so these animals are coming in with wounds and illness they need a good strong immune system to fight that and if they're stressed that's going to lower their immune system so i'll, I'll briefly go over some science there's a lot of this out in the literature. If you want to do some more reading on your own, it's very well studied and documented in people and human medicine literature. 
but essentially um, acute stress uh, stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, which causes a catecholamine release. Um, catecholamines are epinephrine, norepinephrine. That essentially is the fight or flight response. Your heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, blood sugar goes up. Um, and uh, essentially uh, it affects hormones and therefore alters the immune system by binding to immune cells um, or negative feedback of cytokines. And so bunch of science words, but essentially what that means is that if you keep the stressful uh, thing going and the animal remains stressed, you're going to have chronic high levels of circulating corticosterone that will suppress physiologic processes such as immune system function. So um, I would encourage you to look into this more if, if this if you like the kind of uh, physiology behind things, but long story short, if they're stressed, they're not going to heal. And we already kind of talked about this a little bit, but yeah, corticos corticosterone provides negative feedback that decreases functions which are considered non-essential in high stress moments. Therefore, it can disrupt normal physiologic mechanisms such as immune system function. In chronic stress, more corticosterone is needed to mediate catecholamines and excessive catecholamine release can result in shock or even death if prolonged. So in summary, stress will have effects such as delaying growth, impairing the immune system, chronic stress can lead to inflammation, it affects the metabolism, delays wound healing. Long story short, it goes against everything that we're trying to do. We're trying to help these orphaned babies grow up strong and healthy and normally with good normal feather development. Um, birds come in with fractures. It takes a lot of energy um, in order to heal a bone. Uh, wounds, if they're too stressed out, may not heal. So we're considering this throughout every step of the rehab process because we also want to get them out of here as soon as possible. That way they're not going to stay longer and more things are likely to go wrong the longer they stay. So what causes stress in rehab? Uh, I really enjoyed that, Jeff, because it is like an alien abduction. These animals, uh, a lot of them in, are in an urban environment, especially where we're located in Fort Lauderdale, but they are not used to direct interaction with people. You know, they kind of have their lives and we have ours. So stress in a rehab setting, um, they've already been taken out of their normal environment. So everything looks different. They're supposed to be outdoors, now they're inside. Human eye contact and voices is very stressful. That's why we always... Uh, teach our staff, students, and volunteers that you don't look an animal in the eye and you minimize talking around the animals and you kind of have to say everything you want to say before or after you grab an animal and you try not to talk at all while you're examining or treating it unless absolutely necessary. Uh, noises in general. So we see a wide variety of animals in here. We're seeing bunnies and squirrels and we're also seeing raptors. So we have prey and predators in our facility. And so what we do then is we make sure we house them in separate areas, because if you put a hawk in a cage next to a bunny, that bunny is going to be horrified just by that animal's presence. Uh, confinement, they're in a cage, that's not normal for them. Uh, they're used to being able to move around, so that's stressful. Uh, restraint and venipuncture, venipuncture is uh, you know drawing blood. So just being held by what they perceive to be a large predator. Uh, one that people may not think of as much is artificial lighting. So when these animals first come in, while they're very sick, uh, they're being housed indoor in cages where we can uh, watch what they eat, watch how they behave, give them medications, um, and just the act of being in an artificial lighting rather than out in the natural light um, is stressful in itself. And of course, altered diet. Um, so we do our very best to mimic their natural diet. Every animal that we see, um, which we see almost 300 different species here, we make their diet as close to the natural diet that is in the wild. So every animal, we're looking them up if, we're not, if we don't get them commonly, and we're designing their care around trying to make this as close to what they're used to as possible. Um, if, if you're offering them something that they wouldn't normally eat, they're not gonna eat it. And uh, if they're not eating, they're not healing. So what are some signs that your patient might be stressed? In birds, uh, because every animal has different behaviors. And so you need to be able to recognize those behaviors to know is this animal sick or is it just acting stressed? 
Um, birds, some physical signs of stress might be damaged or broken feathers, um, lacerations on their face or abrasions, meaning that are they so freaked out that they're flying into the walls of the cage and banging themselves up? Are they dropping feathers? Are there stress bars in the feathers, which are little lines on their feathers? And that can show up as the feathers are growing if they're going through a stressful insult at the time. And then what we call fluff, which is essentially birds look like a big poof ball um, because they're all huddled up, they're not feeling well, and their feathers kind of stand up. Behavioral, banging around inside the cage, attempting to flee, picking at their own feathers can be a sign of their stress, and also certain vocalizations. People may not think about stress in reptiles. You know, have you ever thought to yourself, hey, is this turtle stressed out right now? Um, the answer is maybe, yeah. Uh, physical signs of stress can be egg retention, not wanting to lay their eggs. We do get some turtles in who are hit by a car as they're crossing the road to try to find the best place to lay their eggs. Um, and so then we do worry while they're here and healing their shell fractures from being hit by the car. Are they holding onto their eggs because they're stressed out? So we try to move them out as fast as possible so that they may feel comfortable in an outdoor occlusion enough to lay their eggs. Um, pigment change in animals, um, like for example, chameleons, we're not treating those here, but that's an example of a reptile that might have a different pigment when it's stressed out um, and abnormal shedding, um, which is seen as snakes, behavioral fleeing, hissing, and tucking inside their shell would all be signs that they're experiencing fear or stress. Um, in the mammals that we see, it does vary a lot between mammals. So one is possums. They have very specific um, response to stress, which is essentially like freezing. Um, and they kind of hold their mouths open and drool. Um, so it's a behavioral response that's typical to that species. Um, squirrels might clack their teeth at you, chirp, thrash their tail. Um, coyotes might have a tucked ear or tail, cowering, freezing, growling. So we see a wide variety of different species here and knowing each one's natural behavior is how we can assess them and say, does this animal need some more to try to reduce its stress while it's in here? Um, stress patients are more likely to be anorectic while in care. So we talked about that. If they're freaked out, they're not gonna eat. If you've ever been super stressed out in your life, you kind of lose your appetite. And if you're trying to heal wounds or get over illness, you need nutrition to do that. So we want these animals to be eating. We want them to feel as comfortable as we possibly can make them so that they can heal. That's our objective with them. So this part is interactive. I'm not seeing the chat, but I wanted to show a few examples of the variety of the appearance of stress in animals. So these burrowing owls, um, they're looking at me. You can see that they clawed at the inside of their box. Um, they're huddled together. Their posture is backwards away from me. They've got their talons kind of, they're just standing, but there's a little bit in the guy with the orange band that you can see like it's almost the claws are ready and out. Um, that's in the chat. There was a question from Teresa asking what signs of stress in cottontail rabbits would be like. Mm. So that's a great question. Cottontail rabbits um, are pretty much going to be panic stress uh, at any point. They're one of our most special uh, stress out species. And that's a really good point to bring up is that some animals are more stressed than others. Um, and, and cottontail rabbits would absolutely be one of those. So um, mostly they're going to try to evade you. They're going to try to run away. If they're extremely stressed out, they will flop on their side and start essentially hyperventilating and then it becomes an emergency because as a prey animal that stress can be super overwhelming and they can die from it a lot quicker than an animal which may be a little more prone to dealing with stress um so they will uh go lateral and start panting and then and then you want to get them in oxygen in a dark quiet space and be as hands off as possible right away um, so yeah, and these owls, they've got their eyes wide. So these animals are stressed. They handle it a little better than some of the others. Okay. This is a typical defensive posture of an Eastern screech owl. This one's quite young, um, but they tend to kind of lower their head, fluff up their feathers and move their bodies side to side. And it's kind of a warning, hey, don't come over here. Look at me, I'm tough. Um, so this guy is um, acting defensive towards my presence. So certainly if he feels the need to do that, 
he's stressed out by the fact that I'm about to go grab him. And there's a little video of that that I was describing there. Uh, this woodpecker, he's got his feathers raised up on his head. Um, so he's not quite full body fluff like that screech owl is, but they will raise their feathers up on their head when they're stressed out. His beak is also slightly parted. Um, so you're going to want to watch their breathing, make sure they don't become dyspneic or essentially like panting. Um, and I've got a nice loose grip on him, uh, so that he can expand his chest and breathe easily. But this is an animal that I'd want to examine very quickly and put down as fast as possible. This hawk is doing the same kind of defensive posture that we were seeing in the other raptors. Um, and you can actually see that his feathers on his wing are looking a little messed up. Um, so maybe he was banging around in that carrier and freaking out and he could damage those feathers and that could really prolong his, his care if we need to re repair broken feathers. Um, so something I would do here would be to put a towel over the carrier um, so that he has a darkness and a barrier, and they tend to be a lot calmer that way versus being exposed and confined. This guy is just trying to climb out, um, just bringing us back to the point that turtles are stressed too, and he certainly could have been put into a small dark box um, with breathing holes where he wouldn't have been so exposed to all the abnormal things going around him. And he's sticking his arm through the bars, and it's just an example of how animals can be um, prone to injury if they're put in a situation in which they're uncomfortable. And just wanted to show some more different postures. So on the far left, we've got a very uh, fluffed up great horned owl. This osprey has his wings slightly drooped, his feathers are fluffed, and his head is low and he's peering at me. Um, and this hawk's got his wings out in kind of a defensive posture. His mouth is open, so he might be vocalizing. Um, or heavy breathing. And I just wanted to show a variety and a few repetitions of what these animals can look like and how much they can vary. Um, this is a bittern and he's doing a defensive posture as well. So they tend to wiggle their head um, and fluff up their feathers. And this little possum is doing the very typical jaw open, um, drooling and frozen still in fear. So ways that we can reduce stress, kind of to sum up what we've talked about so far, we've got sick animals. Our goal is to get them better and to get them outside into our outdoor enclosures where they can um, start conditioning, get strong again, and be released back into the wild. Uh, while they're inside, we're trying to make them as comfortable as possible so that they can heal their wounds, get over their illness. And when they're outside, we're trying to create an outdoor enclosure that replicates their environment so they feel comfortable enough to start getting strong again so they can be athletes in the wild. And knowing their behavior and their natural history is going to help guide how we treat them in order to make them as comfortable as possible so we can reach our goal of releasing these animals again. So one way that we do this is with handling. What you see on this bald eagle is called a hood. And raptors tend to be a lot calmer when you take away their vision. Um, so we will often hood them while we're doing stressful procedures um, in order to help them feel calm. We also might do a light sedation just to kind of take the edge off. Um, so if I was to do something painful like physical therapy, um, I'm going to give them a sedation mixed with a pain medication that will help them to feel calm so that I can stretch out the wing Help them get their range of motion back. Um, it's also a safety issue for us. So you can see that um, the handler is wearing very thick gloves to protect themselves from those very large talons. We apply an audio visual barrier and it can be something as simple as a towel over the door. Um, and when you're doing that, essentially what you're doing is you're taking away them from staring at us. Uh, we don't wanna be looking at them they don't want to be looking at us. These raccoons are young and they're curious, but it also raises the point of we don't want them to get used to people. Uh, they should be they should be fearful of us. And as we're raising young orphaned mammals and birds, we need to be really careful that they don't become comfortable around people because then they would not be a releasable animal. They have to stay wild while they're here. So not only does the audiovisual barrier um, provide a stress relief, but also protects them from the uh, potential of habituation. So a towel is a simple one, hang it up, 
always leave a crack so that sunlight can get through and they can get that diurnal period. You don't want to shut them in complete darkness the whole time they're here because that itself would be stressful. Being able to see the normal photo period of the day um, will keep things more natural. The more natural it is, the less stressful it is. Um, but it also can help kind of mute voices. Um, and usually we're trying to whisper as we're moving around them if we're talking at all. Um, and then on the left is an example of what not to do. So this pelican just had a, a pouch laceration repair. Um, it's quite common with pelicans that they get fishing hook injuries to their pouch, um, which can lead to large tears. So we will um, do a surgery to close those, but this guy is um, kind of panicking in his cage. You can see he's stuck his bill through the cage door um, and he's essentially causing trauma to the area that we just did surgery on. So that's a big example of how not to do it. You want to put up a protective barrier so that they're not uh, gonna be panicking and traumatizing uh, what you just worked on. Uh, and then I kind of talked about before how we really tailor um, things to each species. So this is an example of a cage that we had set up for a fish crow. Um, fish crows are scavengers, they're um, omnivores, they're super intelligent. And so we have provided a variety of perching, um, some foliage to make it feel more natural and a little bit of things that he can pick at and play with um, in order to keep it interesting and stimulated because um, quite an intelligent species, you just don't want it sitting in an empty cage with nothing to look at or do or hop around on. Uh, this is a burrowing owl. And this guy is doing his defensive screaming at the moment. But you can see we've set up a cage here where he has a burrow. So this just goes right back to reproducing a home. A burrowing owl without a burrow is going to be stressed out in his caging. He's got uh, perching. And so really, we're, if, if you can try to replicate their home as closely as possible, then that'll just make them that much more comfortable. Uh, this is a common gallinule, which is one of the most stressed out species that we see. Uh, they really just go into total panic mode and will throw themselves against the cage doors. Um, however, they also do very well in our care because we know that and we plan for it. So you can see this photo of him in his cage. He's still at the back of the cage because he's aware of my presence, but we've got lots of natural foliage in there for him to hide in because they are birds that are going to be playing in the reeds. Um, hiding in the marshes. And so that cover, that natural cover is going to make them feel as comfortable as possible. And I was peeking to see if he had eaten and I can see that the diet's been disturbed. Um, so maybe he just ran through it. This guy, he was doing very well. He ate. Um, and we do change out that foliage almost daily. You don't want them in there with a bunch of dry, dying leaves. You want it to be fresh and green so they have lots of cover and they feel as safe as possible. This is an example of um, our an outdoor enclosure. Um, and on the left, you can kind of see that the foliage has died. Um, the trees are quite bare. So that's an example of what not to do versus on the right. Which habitat would you rather be in? Um, so it's really kind of a simple concept, but it's something that where you have to do that little extra mile um, in order to uh, have them do well because at the point that they're moving to an outdoor enclosure um because remember they're coming in they stay in the hospital they're in the cage and then they're moving out when they move out they've overcome their injury they've overcome their illness and they need to be strong again wild animals do not uh, have a plate delivered to them out in the wild they need to forage they need to hunt and so they need to be athletes they need to evade predators navigate their environment and so they have to be very strong. And a lot of times when they've been feeling a fracture for four weeks, just sitting in a cage, they get atrophy of their muscles that they would use for flight um, as an example. And so we need to provide them an outdoor space where they can move around, get strong again, but in the same concept, now they're a healthy animal. So they're even more stressed when they're sick, they're a little bit subdued, but now they're healthy. So we need to make them feel very comfortable in our outdoor enclosures so that they're not flying into the walls and injuring themselves, but they feel comfortable in their environment where they have the space. They're not cowering in a corner. They're not going to condition that way. And they're not throwing themselves against the wall in fear. And we have a lot of success in doing that and just replicating the environment. And it's fun. It's really fun to be able to look up a species, say, how do you live in the wild? 
And how can I replicate that here so you're as happy and comfortable as possible? And so a little bit of enclosure design goes a long way. Uh, just some other examples. Um, this little fox will always, they choose where they feel safest in the enclosure. So you want to give them options. Um, if you can, having a large enclosure with several different hives, um, animals that can be together do combine because if they're naturally a pack animal in the wild, they're going to want friends. Um, but they'll choose the spot in their enclosure where they feel the safest. Um, and so maybe making sure that they have easy food and water access to wherever that hive might be in case they don't want to come out. Um, and then I uh, talk about limpkins. They have quite a specialized diet eating apple snails. So we really have a challenge here with the limpkins um, and uh, to get the exact diet that they need. And it becomes harder to provide them with that. So what we'll do is we'll actually get snail shells and pack different things inside of them for them to eat. So at least it feels as close as possible. But it's just another emphasis on the variety of the types of species we treat and how much we need to uh, really consider each one as an individual. Uh, a little bit about reptiles. You know, we always think about the birds and the mammals, but I like to consider the reptiles too, because Florida has a lot of great reptiles. Um, and so you want to consider their well-being as well. They're animals too, and they have stress reactions and fears and needs the same. And one important thing to think about is temperature. So um, reptiles are often ectothermic. They need their temperature in their environment to be appropriate. Um, both the ambient temperature, a basking spot where they have a heat, a higher heat area where they can kind of gain that energy through heat, um, the water temperature for our aquatic turtles, all has to be appropriate. And so that can be quite a challenge creating a microenvironment for them. Um, where we really replicate that, but they're not going to heal if they can't thermoregulate -re appropriately. Uh, we already kind of talked about this. If they want to be social, they'll be less stressed. If they're used to being around other animals of themselves, then they're going to be less stressed out if you add them together. But you do have to be careful when adding animals. You want to watch them for like a day and make sure that they're not going to fight. Um, in these little screech owls on the left, the guy closest was added later to this group of three. And for the first day, he was kind of shunned. And then day two, you can see they were a happy little gang. So uh, they find comfort in each other's presence. However, you're not going to want to add animals together where they're going to be territorial, because that would be a different source of stress. Now I've got a competitor. So it just goes down to, again, we know each of these species so uh, deeply in their behavior and their needs and their natural history. Uh, something as simple as adding a mirror, if you don't have a friend, um, this little osprey, we, we didn't have a, a buddy for him, so we add a mirror and it almost cr creates a comfort pretty much as soon as we put it in, um, he was staring at it most of the time. And then this little baby possum, um, another type of animal that you would want with others, and this one was uh, more critical, so it needed to be kept in our ICU, and so you just add a snuggie in there, and that creates a source of comfort uh, when they're used to cuddling up in mom's pouch. Now he's got something to cuddle against, and you can see that he was preferentially moving towards that. Um, once he got over his sickness, we were able to add him with others. Uh, this is an example of our uh, raccoon enclosure, and I really love this enclosure so much because raccoons are a very um, challenging species to rehab. Um, they are highly intelligent. You have to take extreme caution in not getting them used to the presence of people because when we release them, we want to make sure that they're not going to become a nuisance animal that is dumpster diving, um, but an animal that's going to go out and forage and have a healthy natural fear and distance from humans. Um, they're also very curious animals. They're very dexterous animals. They're using their hands to explore their environment. So we like to provide them with a lot of space to climb and explore and different things to keep them distracted and comfortable. Um, and so they don't get bored and destructive with themselves. So, if you would like to interact, this 
talk was originally made for a, a, an in-person talk. So what are some things we can put in these species enclosure? Um, we've got a barred owl, a wood stork, and a little grebe. Um, so what are some things that you would add to a cage for these animals to try to make them as comfortable as possible? If you want to throw your responses in the chat. Um, like I said, it's it's all fairly straightforward, but it's taking the time to go that extra mile. So we'll give you guys a minute or so to put your answers in the chat if you do want to be involved in the presentation and what you guys think would be a good option for um, helping these animals if they were patients be a little less stressed. We have Christian in the chat saying perches and foliage for the barred owl. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And varying size perches too. I mean, you don't want them to always be gripping the same size branch. Um, I'm having trouble seeing the messages in the chat personally. Oh, it's okay. I'm, I have it up so you I read can them. read them to Wait. you when they pop in. Okay, cool. Um, and let's see if anyone else wants to drop any options in there. It, it, and it's really not that challenging. You know, you go yeah. outside on, we go outside our own property and just find branches nearby. Um, and a little bit goes a long way. Um, so it might sound super obvious, but when you're really busy and you've got 200 animals and, you know, only so many people to take care of them, uh, taking the time, finding the time to go this little extra mile, you're going to prevent a lot of issues. If an animal is panicking, it's going to hurt itself, it's not going to heal. Um, and also making sure you add a water element for animals that are used to having a water element. If they're used to fishing like a wood stork, you put their fish in water when you offer it to them, they're more likely to eat it. Um, Christian had another suggestion for the wood stork too. Um, maybe a container with water if the facility does not have a pond in the enclosure. Wonderful, absolutely. And uh, and and we and we do offer that we have pools for them when they move out, and we try to put them in the largest cage as possible with a nice big palm frond in there to provide some cover and a water dish in in their large cage as well. Um, giving them proper space. We don't want them in a too small cage for that species where they're not going to be able to move around comfortably. So having the option for large and small caging is also ideal. Um, for this little grebe, it, it will get daily tub time um, with a nice like UV lamp to provide that kind of diurnal uh, photo period and to swim and it eats better when you feed it in the water. All right, we'll move along. Just some more examples. Um, on the right, this was our very cute striped skunk patient um, who was actually in the news uh, when it was here. Um, and uh, you can see that we gave it a large variety of hides. In this case, it was choosing to kind of nestle in the hay, but giving it um, areas where it can climb out and keeping the food and water source near the hides where it's going to feel comfortable enough to come out and eat. Um, the species on the left is a uh, Chuckle's widow and they have those large eyes. So this species flies around and catches bugs in the air while it's flying. So it's incredibly challenging for us to feed it while it's in rehab. We can't really reproduce that, um, but it's also another species that's highly stressed and because of those big bug eyes, if it is freaking out and it's rubbing its eyes on things, it's going to get ulcers or scratch, scratches on the cornea that can become a, a nightmare to treat. Um, so giving it a large, a large area to work in um, and knowing that, okay, this animal catches uh, insects midair, if I offer it a dish of something, it's, it's probably not going to eat it. And um, so unfortunately, usually that means these animals were assist feeding throughout their time, um, which is an added challenge, but one where you would need to know that about the species in order to do it. There was a question too, going back to water. Um, okay. The question was, what if the species is debilitated and at risk for drowning overnight, but it's a species that needs water, what would we do? That's a wonderful question. In that case, I do not offer them water because at that point in their care, they are so debilitated that I'm focusing more on the medical aspect than like the behavioral. So if I, this happens all the time, you get animals come in, they're completely flat out, their head is hanging, they can't lift their heads on their own. I'm not gonna offer that animal any sort of dish overnight for fear that it would drown in it. And essentially we start introducing those things once they're perky enough. 
once they kind of get over that hump, an animal like that would go into my ICU, which is our critical care area. It would probably get an IV catheter with fluids, just depending on what's going on with it. Um, and only once it is able to hold its head up on its own, um, then I would offer that. So yes, sometimes it's not always about getting them that as quickly as possible, but knowing where your animal is at in the stage of care, where it's ready to even kind of appreciate that addition. That animal is going to be so out of it at that point in time, I'm going to protect it from drowning before I add something um, like a natural element. Because yes, I want to offer its fish and water, but if it's so down and out that it can't even lift its own head, it's not going to eat that anyways. That's a wonderful question and a great point. Thank you. Some other thoughts, keep noise levels down, consider traffic by caging. Um, putting higher stress animals in an area where there's less traffic. So in an ideal world, there's no traffic by any of the caging, but that's not reality because we're working in a space um, and we're busy and we've got lots of animals to feed, to medicate. Um, they're being moved between spaces, but I'm not going to put, for example, a cottontail in any sort of area where people are going to be working in their day. Um, Certain animals cope with the stress better than others. There's certain raptors that cope with the stress better than other raptors. Um, but consider being strategic about where you build your enclosures and your caging and how you organize your layout space um, in order to make sure that the ones who are going to freak out are not going to be where you're walking by as you're working. Um, and that applies even within a room. Um, and then also reading the animal as an individual and saying, okay, this isn't working. I need to move this to a different space uh, where it's not going to be so stressed. Uh, final tool, if you have a veterinarian on your team, you can use oral um, anti-anxiety medications. Um, I have about four different anti-anxiety medications that I keep here, which I can use individually or in combination for the animals that really need that little extra edge taken off. So I'm not going to just add a medication without giving them the proper setup and setting them up to succeed first. Um, but certainly if I've done what I can in terms of putting up a barrier, adding my foliage, offering the proper diet, keeping them in a quiet, stress-free place with the kind of light that they need, um, and they're still having anxiety, uh, then I'm going to start adding in medications, which can be used in combination at lower doses to create a safe, slight sedative effect um, that will help them stay calm so they don't hurt themselves while they're trying to heal something else. Okay, that's it. Um, does anyone have any questions, any further questions? So if you guys do have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, one thing that I wanted to bring up that people might be curious about, because you showed all those habitats that we have here on our property that have the different foliage to keep the animals covered and things like that. So do you want to touch briefly on like how you can monitor patients that we have that are more high stress that you really want to make sure they don't get habituated things like foxes, bobcats, coyotes, how would you monitor them to make sure they're behaving the way that they should if you can't really see where they are? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. So we will use things like trap cams or nanny cams in order to watch them from a distance. So we actually have a bobcat patient right now who we have a trap cam on. And through that camera, I am able to see that this animal is walking normally, eating normally, its surgery site is healing well, everything looks uh, normal, it seems comfortable in its environment, and I never even have to approach that enclosure. So a very um, private and high stress animal such as that, I can watch feedback on a video through a camera and assess them without ever even having to stress them out by watching them directly. Awesome. Um, there was a question too, do you wean them off the oral medications? It just depends what oral medication I'm using and um, and uh, for how long they're on it. Um, but I have not seen any side effects per se if I do stop it abruptly. But yeah, if I have them on multiple, I will. I'll take away one first, see how they're doing, take away another, see how they're doing. And we can also, when we move them outside, if it's a super stressful bird, such as a Cooper's hawk, it's like a very panicky kind of raptor, um, you can put those medications in the food. So you can wean them slowly, by adding it to the diet, so 
we move them outside. I don't want to be grabbing them twice a day. That would defeat my purpose, right? If I'm if I'm grabbing you just to give you an anti-stress med, it's not worth it. Um, but I can put it in the food and if they're going to eat it that way, they can kind of like have a nice transition. So it just depends on what medications, but if I do have multiple, then I will take away one at a time. Awesome. I'm going to stop your screen share so everyone could see you big again. Um, and I am not seeing any other questions in the chat. If you do have any last questions, feel free to drop them in there before we end our call today. Um, but I do want to thank all of you guys for tuning in to our wild lecture series. And of course, uh, thanking Dr. C for taking time out of her busy day to chat with us and talk a little bit about how we're reducing stress here with our patients. Um, so thank you guys so much. For those of you, I know there are a bunch of you that popped on a little later. Um, we will be posting the recording onto our YouTube channel. So if you missed the beginning of her presentation or you want to revisit anything that she talked about, I will send that link out as soon as I get it uploaded. Um, and I couldn't tell there was a reaction. I wasn't sure if that was a question or if that was someone just waving. So if you do have a question, go ahead and type it in the chat. Um, then we can get your question answered before we... And if you guys are not already following us on social media, um, we are on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok under South Florida Wildlife Center. If you just give us a search, you'll be able to find it. Dr. C was mentioning about the bobcat that we currently have here for rehab, and we do have some awesome trap cam footage that we will be sharing on our social media in the next few days. So make sure you guys are following us so you can see that cool footage that we have, as well as learn about all the other patients that we have here at our center. Um, and then there's some thanks for you in the chat too. So I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, thank you guys so much again for joining us today and feel free to stay tuned for all of our upcoming speakers. We have a lot of really great people joining us throughout the rest of the year to talk a little bit more about the work that they are doing with wildlife and conservation. So thank you guys so much and I hope you have an awesome rest of your day. Bye guys. <laughs>